Welcome back, friends. Dan Vega here, Spring Developer Advocate at VMware. Today, we're going to be discussing the number one Spring Boot starter you should include in every single project that you create. Now, what could that be? Hmm. If you got a guess, pause the video and let me know below before we get into it. So you head over to start.spring.io, you fill in some metadata about your project, and then you go over to the right and you have to pick some dependencies. There are so many dependencies to choose from depending on what type of application you're building. What is the one that you should include in every single project? Now there is no wrong answer here. This is really just an opinion, but my opinion is that in every single project, you should include the Spring Boot Actuator. Now, why is this? This is because we all should have a goal when we're creating a new application, and that is to get it to the promised land, to get it into production. Doesn't matter if this is just a simple demo, if this is the next great SaaS product that we're building, if this is an MVP, whatever we are doing, we should want to get this application out to production. And that is where the Spring Boot Actuator really helps us out. The Spring Boot Actuator includes a number of additional features to help you monitor and manage your applications when you push them into production. It's not just enough to build something, put it into production, and do one of these as you wait for traffic. You really need to understand what's happening with your application and a lot of these features start with the Spring Boot Actuator. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to build a new application from scratch. We're going to include the Spring Boot Actuator and then we'll talk about what we get out of the box and then what we can do to configure it further and take a look at a lot of the endpoints that come with the Spring Boot Actuator. From there, there's also a way to create your own custom endpoints. So if you want to add some additional functionality to the actuator, you can, so we'll cover that as well. So this is really going to be a nice introduction to the Spring Boot Actuator, but again, I think it is the number one Spring Boot starter that you should include in every single project because our goal should be to get these out to production. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and write some code. All right, so to get started, we're gonna head over to start.spring.io. We're gonna create a new project here. I'm going to use Maven. Java, the latest stable version of Spring Boot at the time is 3.1.3. I'm gonna fill in some net metadata here. We'll call this dev.danvega and we'll say this is the actuator demo. So now we go over to pick some dependencies and what are we gonna include? Again, I think the first one that we should include in every single app is the Spring Boot actuator. Now, depending on what type of application we're gonna build, this is going to drive our decisions next. In this case, I'm probably just gonna create a very simple app. Maybe I'll include some web dependency uh, to build out a web application. So with that, uh, we can go ahead and generate our project. This will download a zip file. I'll go ahead and open this up in my favorite IDE, uh, IntelliJ IDEA. You can open it up in whatever IDE or text editor you're most productive in. With that, let's write some code. All right, so I have my project open. I have my main application here. I'm going to go ahead and just run this application and we'll take a look at what's going on underneath the hood here. So if we look in the console, we can see some things happening. The line I, line I want to look at here is it says exposing one endpoint beneath the base path of slash actuator. So what does this mean? This means we can head over to the browser, try to open up localhost 8080 slash actuator and see if any endpoints are available. So I'm on localhost 8080. I haven't defined any other mappings yet, so this doesn't work, but we should be able to go to slash actuator. And indeed, we have some endpoints. So we have the self endpoint, which is the actuator endpoint. We have health, and then we have health with a path. So let's see from a health standpoint what's there. So not a whole lot to begin with. It does give us a status of up. This is really nice. This is going to be an indicator for other applications to call into our application and find out if our status is up. So that is one thing, but that is all we get out of the box. Why is this happening? Let's go ahead and jump over to the documentation. So if you check out the Spring Boot docs under the reference documentation, there's a section on production ready features. This is where you're gonna find uh, some of the stuff with the actuator, the endpoints, metrics, observability, etc. cetera. So um, Spring Boot includes a number of additional features to help you monitor and manage your application that we get. We can choose to manage and monitor these over HTTP endpoints or JMX, right now we're on HTTP. You can do things like auditing, health, and metrics gathering uh, can automatically be applied to your application. So how do we do it? We already did that. We included the Spring Boot Starter Actuator. Again, my number one 
um, Spring Boot started that I would include. So actuator endpoints let you monitor and interact with your application. There's a number of built-in endpoints, and you can add your own. We'll add one a little bit later on. You can also enable or disable each individual endpoint. This is important as well. This is why there's only a couple right off the bat. Uh, we want to go ahead and enable some others so we can see some more information. So we have our prefix of slash actuator. We can see more about all of the available endpoints that are available, right? And so there's a nice ID and then a description of what that endpoint is going to give us. Now, some of these might be based on if you have another dependency included. Um, some of them are, um, most of them are disabled by default. And then you can just kind of go through and see these. So we'll go through some of these today. Not going to dive deep into every single one of them. But these IDs are important. So let's pick one out here and say beans displays a complete list of all the spring beans in our application. So this is important. We, we understand what the application context is. If you don't, that's okay. I've done a deep dive on an intro to spring. I'll leave a description in the video below. But let's go ahead and enable this beans endpoint and take a look at that. So I'm back in my application. I'm gonna go over to application.properties and we're going to need to enable this. So how do we do this? So if we go into management, uh, we can see that there are endpoints. So there's a web, uh, I believe there's JMX, but we're, we're using HTTP, right? We want to include certain endpoints. So we can come in here and say health, which is already there, and we can say beans, which is another one. So let's go ahead and restart our application and head back over to the browser. And now if we refresh this, we see there's a new endpoint there. So this is the beans endpoint. If we jump into that, we will see information about all the different beans in the application context. So we can go through here and see all of them. There's not gonna be a lot of our code because we haven't uh, written a whole lot of custom code yet, but a lot of these are coming from the framework itself. But this is important when we start writing our code as to get some insight as to what's going on in our application. So let's just take a look at one more. I'm gonna go ahead and instead of listing out the individual beans that I want to enable, I'm going to use a star and enable all of them. So let's go ahead and rerun our application. Go back over here and refresh. And now you can see we have a whole bunch of endpoints available to us. Again, we're not going to go through each of these. I'm going to go through a few of them, though, and we'll talk about why these are important. And actually, before we do that, let me do one more thing. So we had that health endpoint but that health endpoint only had one key value in there, which was status and that it was up. I want some more details about the current state of my application. So I'm going to go over to management, endpoint, health, show details, and set this to always. Now, it's important to, remote as, to note, as I'm setting these, this isn't something that I would do in production. These are disabled by default because we don't want to just expose this information. So um, we would probably hide this, you know, whatever application is exposing these. There'd be some kind of security behind that. Um, this I'm doing just locally just to kind of show you this off. So let's go ahead and rerun our application. I'm going to go back over to the browser. And if we go down to health and click on that, now you can see we get some more information about our health. So we have components. In this case, disk space. Uh, the status is up. Here's the details. Uh, there's a ping status. Uh, that is up. So some more information about the health of our application. And we can actually add on to this if we wanted to. All right, so another endpoint I want to take a look at is the info endpoint. Let's go ahead and click on this and look at all of the information in here. Oh, wait, there's nothing. So what is going on here? So this is an endpoint that we can go ahead and customize to our own application's need. The info endpoint is a way to add arbitrary information about your application so that another uh, calling application could read this end endpoint and get info about your app. So how do we do this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and add some information. I can do that by saying info.app dot name is equal to the name of the application. Let's just call this the actuator demo. And we'll say this is an event management application. Here's the version. Here's the author. Maybe I wanted to go ahead and uh, show where the documentation for these APIs are. So we could say docs are over here. 
at danvega.dev. They're not, but just so you know. So now we add all this information here. We can go ahead and restart our application and head back to the browser, refresh this. Oh, and I forgot one thing. We're just going to need to say management.info.env.enabled equals true. And let's go ahead and restart that. And if I rerun that, now I go ahead and get information about my application. So again, that was just one um, kind of map there, app. You could put more information in there. Anything you need to kind of document your application that other applications can go ahead and call this endpoint and retrieve. Now I'm going to drop a few more in here. So I want to get more information about maybe the build. Uh, I want to get information about Git, maybe Java, uh, maybe the OS environment. Um, so most of this stuff I can enable. The one, I think the, um, let's see, the build we're going to need a little bit more about. We can go into our pom.xml. I'm going to just quickly change this to say, hey, go ahead and um, set an execution goal for build info. And maybe you can add some additional properties to this as well. So now when I go ahead and do this, if I go ahead and build my application. So let's just say Maven Spring Boot. Um, we can just run it for a second. Uh, if we do that, now if we go ahead and look in our target folder and we look under classes and meta info, now we have some build info properties which the actuator endpoint can now read from. And as you can see from the build, end, uh, build properties here, we get that info. We are getting information about the version of Java that we're running. Here's the runtime, the JVM. We also get information about the operating system. And then we enabled Git. There's, a, I think, another plugin you'll need to enable for Git to kind of show up here. Uh, but as you can see, from the info standpoint, there are some things that we can do to really enable some information in our application. And I really like this, especially for other applications in our organization, especially where there's a ton of microservices, right? Uh, being able to call an endpoint and find out what this endpoint is all about, who can I contact, where's the documentation, uh, I really like this particular endpoint. So that's one. Uh, let's talk about another one. So if we go in here, we talked about the beans and the mappings before. Let's take a look at building out our own mapping. Let's just make a simple controller. So I'm going to come in here and create a home controller. We'll say that this is a REST controller. I'll set a uh, git mapping to the uh, root. And then I'll say, hey, let's go ahead and return a string. Return hello world. And that is it. So I'm going to rerun my application. I'm going to go back over to, oh, we started it from the terminal before. Let's go ahead and stop that. I'm going to go ahead and run it from here. And now we can go back over to our application, run this again. And now let's take a look at beans. So if we look at beans, we should have a home controller. And indeed we do. So we could see that bean is in the application context. Here's the scope. So by default, everything is a singleton. Here's the type. So the name of the controller, there, the name of the class. Where is it located? Are there other dependencies? So if we had a constructor that took some dependencies and we get those through dependency injection, Spring will be able to kind of list those out here. So this is a really good way to get some insight into the different beans in your application context. Um, another one is mappings. So if we go down and see mappings here, now we can go in here and see, um, let's see the home, where is that? So now we can see our handler is the home controller class uh, and home method. This is has a predicate for Git, so it's uh, responding to Git requests. Here's the details for it. Here's the actual class name, the name of the method. What is it going to return? It's returning a string. And then here are some, some extra information about the request mapping. So again, just gives you some detailed insights into all the different mappings in your application. One more I'm going to look at here is the config props. This is really nice, so it'll go in and tell you information about your configuration. So if we went in here and said, um, so let's go change something really quick. I want to go in and let's say in our application.properties, I'm going to change the server dot, 
server dot port equal to 8081. Let's go ahead and refresh this. And we should start on 8081 now. So we'll have to change this, but that's okay. And now if we go into config props and look for server dot port, So in here we see our port was changed. Where was it changed? It is a class path resource in application.properties. Here is the line in the column. This is really important when you start to talk about Spring's ability to override configuration based on different property sources, we can see the actual source where this is coming from, where this config change happened. So this is another really good endpoint. So there are a bunch of endpoints in here. Metrics we're gonna get into when we start talking about observability. I'm gonna do another tutorial on that. Um, so all the different metrics are in here. Take a look at those. Um, things like loggers. So we can get a, a look at all the loggers in our system and you can even post to a logger and change the actual logging level at runtime, which is really, really cool. So take a look through the documentation on all the different actuator endpoints, what information is available, and then just go through and take a look at them yourselves. Now this is great, but what happens when you wanna add your own endpoint? All right, to add my own endpoint, I'm gonna come in here and create a new class. We're gonna call this the random endpoint. So I'm gonna create a new class called random endpoint, and to do so, I'm going to add the endpoint annotation. I'm going to give it an ID of random. Now in here, I can create different operations. I could have an endpoint where I want to read something, like most of the information that we've seen in the endpoint so far have been reads. I mentioned the logger endpoint where that's really a write operation. So I wanna say, hey, allow me to post something and write something. So in the, in the, the case of being able to change a logging level, that's a write operation. But what I wanna do is I wanna come in here and then say, that I need to go ahead and have a read operation. So I'm gonna say read operation. In this case, Copilot is right on. We are basically saying, hey, we want to provide a random number. So I'm gonna return an integer um, with a random number times uh, 100. So let's see if we can get this to work. And I think I forgot one thing. I may wanna mark this with that service. Uh, let's go ahead and run this application. Now I'm gonna go back to the browser and go to the actuator endpoint. And if we look in here, uh, we have a new endpoint now. So this is random. If we go ahead and click on this, I'm gonna bump this font up a little. Every time we refresh this, we are getting a random number. Now I know this is a pretty arbitrary example, but you can imagine writing your own code in here to do whatever you need it to do to provide some information about the status or health or whatever is going on in your application. So you can write your end own endpoints. This is a read operation. There's another annotation for a write operation. So cool, I think that's all I wanted to cover. I wanted to talk about why I think the actuator is the one Spring Boot starter you should include in every single application. We looked at what you get out of the box if you just run the application. Not many endpoints are available. You need to enable them and we do that through our application.properties. My one of the nice uh, endpoints, in my opinion, is the info. The uh, info endpoint allow us to add some arbitrary information about our application to that endpoint. And then, obviously, at the end, we took a look at being able to write our own endpoints. So, um, I really hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to dive into the actuator, this is a really good time. Uh, jump in there, learn all about it, take a tour of the endpoints, and see what can be helpful to you or your organization here. So hey, I hope you found this helpful. If you did, do me a favor, friends. Go ahead and leave me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. And as always, happy coding. Hey.